friends, I'm Jill Morricone, and I just want to welcome you to another edition of 3ABN Sabbath School Panel as we journey through the book of Hebrews. It's hard to believe we're almost at the end of this journey. We're on lesson number 12 this week, Receiving an Unshakable Kingdom. I want to remind you, if you have not already gotten your own copy of the quarterly to follow along with us, you can go to the following website, 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com, and you can download your own copy to follow along, or you can catch up with any of the programs that we've aired in the past. That website, once again, is 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. So grab your Bible and your pen and paper and get ready for this edition of 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. have so loved this journey through the book of Hebrews. What a blessing it's been to dive deep into the Word of God and study with you at home. Thank you for being part of the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. And today I'm on the panel with my brothers. The brethren are here today. I want to introduce them to you. They don't really need any introduction because they're part of the family. To my left, Pastor James Rafferty. Good to have you here. Good to be here, Jill. I'm going to be looking at you have come to God, the judge of all. Amen. To your left, Pastor John Lomacain. Glad you're here, Pastor. Good to be here, and I'm covering Shake the Heavens and the Earth. Ooh, sounds good. To your left, Pastor John Denzi. Glad you're here. I'm blessed to be here. I have Wednesday, an unshakable kingdom. Amen. Looking forward to this study. Last but not least, Pastor Ryan Day. Glad you're here too, brother. Always a blessing, yes. And today we're going to be learning how to be grateful in the Lord. Amen. Ryan, would you pray for us before Absolutely. we open up our study? Yes, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, this has been such an honor to be here on this panel, yes. to be able to go through this study together, Lord. And um, God, we praise you for your word. We praise you for your truth mm -hmm. and for this day you have given us, Lord, to once again reflect and dive deep into your word to learn more of your will. So we ask for the Holy Spirit once more, Lord, to lead and guide us, to give us the words, to give us the thoughts, that of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. that each and every one of us, those at home, all watching around the world, and those of us here on this panel and here in this, in this studio, Lord, may we all be drawn to Jesus Christ because of the powerful gospel message that we are learning through the book of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. We thank you and we praise you. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Last week we studied, of course, the Saints Hall of Fame. I think that's what Shelley called it. Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 11 and then Hebrews chapter 12, the very beginning, that we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher or perfecter of our faith. This week we continue on in Hebrews chapter 12, specifically verses 18 all the way down through 29, receiving an unshakable kingdom. You know, there's a comparison the lesson brought out on Sabbath's portion of the lesson. Hebrews chapter 1 begins with what? God, who spoke to us in times past, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. Mm -hmm. We come down to Hebrews 12, 25, and what does it say? See that you do not refuse Him who speaks. So in the beginning, He's speaking to us. We get to the end. We need to pay attention when He speaks to us. This lesson is kind of divided into four different sections, and we're all going to cover one of those sections. The beginning is the inauguration of the new covenant. Jesus became the mediator of the new covenant. He provides his blood, provides salvation for all believers. At Jesus' ascension to heaven, where he sat at the right hand of the Father, his kingly rule and priestly ministry began. We look at the judgment that is coming the judgment that brings destruction to his enemies, but that brings vindication to his people because judgment is in favor of the saints. We look at God's eternal kingdom. Christ received the kingdom and he will share it with the believers. The saints of the Most High will possess it forever. The righteous will not be shaken and Christ's kingdom cannot be shaken. And finally, we look at acceptable worship. What is acceptable worship to God? Let's look at our memory text. We're in Hebrews 12, verse 28. Memory text is Hebrews 12, 28. 
Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. On Sunday's lesson, we look at you have come to Mount Zion. And the lesson wants us to read Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. But I want to go back because I believe that sets the contrast between the two mountains, the mountain and the Mount Zion. Let's go back to Hebrews 12, verse 18. We're going to pick it up there. And we have seven takeaways today for the Old Covenant experience and the New Covenant experience. So in Hebrews 12, verse 18, for you have not come to the mountain. Now this is Mount Sinai discussed in Exodus chapter 19. You have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire to blackness and darkness and tempest, the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. Verse 20, for they could not endure what was commanded and if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. That's a direct quote from Exodus mm -hmm. chapter 19, verse 21. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. What's happening here? Mm -hmm. This is the old covenant given on Mount Sinai. We see the blackness and the darkness and the tempest, the fear and terror that the people felt. Takeaway number one, time period does not necessarily equal experience. Now you might say, what in the world are you talking about, Joe? I believe this is an old covenant time mm -hmm. and many people under the old covenant time had an old covenant experience. Exodus chapter 19, that's where the people felt fear mm. and terror and blackness and darkness and tempest. Now they were clearly under the old covenant time. Jesus had not come yet and they were under the sacrificial system. They were under that old covenant time. And yet they had an old covenant experience of fear and terror and rules and regulations. I believe that under the old covenant time, some people could have a new covenant experience. Now, that's not to say that Jesus had come. I'm not trying to say that theologically. We understand that Jesus had not come under the old covenant time. But yet in Deuteronomy 11, it says that he could write the law in their hearts. That's a new covenant experience. In Deuteronomy 10, it says the Lord delighted in you and loved you and your fathers. That's a new covenant experience. In Exodus 19, it said he bore you on eagle's wings. That's a new covenant experience. So what God wanted was the people even under the old covenant to have the new covenant experience, but sadly many people didn't. Then we have the new covenant time and the new covenant experience, which is the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. We see in the book of Hebrews is supposed to be the new covenant time and the new covenant experience, where Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. And we see Jesus high priestly ministry and the access through the veil to the father. We see that there's no longer animal sacrifices that Jesus died once and for all. But sadly, many people today live under the new covenant time and we have an old covenant experience. Is that your experience? Do you live under the new covenant time? Because clearly Jesus has come. We are under the new covenant time. And yet we don't allow him to write the law in our hearts. We don't live with Jesus. We live with just rules and regulations. We don't experience the blood of Jesus. We don't have assurance of salvation. We have that fear and terror and blackness experience from Exodus chapter 19. We don't have the light of his presence. So takeaway, that leads us to takeaway number two. Beware, lest you walk today in an old covenant experience. Mm. Many Christians today can walk even under the new covenant, but still in an old covenant experience. Paul warned the Galatian believers of this in Galatians chapter three, verse three. He says, are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, this is the new covenant experience, mm -hmm. recognizing that we're saved by grace through faith. Are you now made perfect in the flesh? Are you going back to the old covenant experience? Even though you truly are under the new covenant, are you walking in the old covenant experience? Galatians 5, 4 to me is one of the saddest verses in the whole Bible. It says, you've become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. 
you are in the new covenant and you could have the experience of walking in the new covenant experience, but are you walking in an old covenant experience? Now let's look at the new covenant experience. So in Hebrews 12, we had looked at that mountain of fear and terror and trembling is the old covenant. Let's look at the new covenant. We pick it up in verse 22, Hebrews 12, 22. But you have come. You don't have to be stuck in Mount Sinai. You have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. We've come to Mount Zion through faith in the person of our representative, Jesus Christ. That's right. We've come to Mount Zion as opposed to Mount Sinai, where there's darkness and tempest and fear. Jesus is the center of this celebration with God and the angels. We see here the inauguration of the new covenant, Jesus' enthronement after his ascension. Mm. Takeaway number three, because of Jesus, we have everything. We have the new covenant experience. We have right. access to him through the veil, Hebrews chapter 10. We have cleansing from sin, Hebrews chapter nine. We have access to the father, Hebrews chapter four. We have rest, Hebrews chapter three and four. We have an intercessor and a high priest, Hebrews chapter seven and eight. We have a mediator, Hebrews right. chapter nine and 12. So it's interesting, it says we have come to Mount Zion. I won't spend too much time on this, but if you look back to Psalm chapter two, now Paul actually quotes this in Hebrews one, he references back to Psalm two and Psalm 110. But Psalm chapter two, verse six and seven, it says, yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I have set, God is acting here, and I have set is a technical term, meaning install into office. Mm. I would declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Mm. Now we covered this on previous lessons. This does not mean Jesus was created. Jesus was preexistent. Jesus is divine. Jesus was the creator. We see that clearly in John right. 1. We see that clearly in Hebrews 1 and many other passages of the word. But at this time, we're speaking specifically of the inauguration of the new covenant. Jesus being installed as the priest king after his ascension. We see the same thing in Psalm 110, verse one. The Lord, that's God the Father, said to my Lord, that's Jesus the Messiah, sit at my right hand, that's the place of power, till I make your enemies your footstool. We see the same thing in Revelation chapter five. Who could open the scroll and loose the seals? Jesus, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, he rose up. And this is his time of ascension. You could say right after the ascension, the enthronement right there at the right hand of the Father, the inauguration of the new covenant and his kingly and priestly rule. Verse 23. This is Hebrews 12, verse 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, uh, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now we're gonna go very quickly, but takeaway number four is because of Jesus, our names can be registered in the book of heaven. Okay. Next verse, verse 24. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Takeaway number five, because of Jesus, we receive an eternal inheritance. Takeaway number six, because of Jesus, we are purchased back. We are redeemed from what our sin deserved. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption mm -hmm. through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Jesus' death bought us back from what our sins deserved mm. because he's the mediator of the new covenant. We receive forgiveness. And finally, takeaway number seven, because of Jesus, sins committed before Jesus came, they can be forgiven as well. Not just the sins since he came, but the sins before when people sacrificed animals looking forward with faith to the coming Messiah, mm. that blood of Jesus covers all sin. Amen. 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 Whew, that was such a blessing. Uh, a great summary of the book of Hebrews, uh, Jill. And it's so hard for us. I think we're at the end of this now. It's so hard to kind of stop because there's so much here. Uh, I looked at the quarterly and I thought, 
wow, these are great lessons. And I thought, but there's so much more we could. I think, John, you mentioned that there was a quarterly that covered the book of Hebrews in three quarters mm -hmm. instead of one quarter, if you can imagine. I'm James Rafferty, and I have Monday's lesson, which is called or entitled, You Have Come to God, the Judge of All. And it's based on Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23. Let's just read that verse, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23. Here's what it says. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And the lesson basically says, let's read that and then let's recognize that this is a celebration. Mm. But if this is a celebration, why is God described as a judge? How can a judge be part of a reason for celebration? And it asks us to read Daniel chapter 7, 9 and 10 and verses 13 to 22, but I'm not going to go there. I want to go to Revelation, my favorite book, Revelation <laughs> chapter 19, verses 1 through 6, because we have this incredible explanation of the celebration and the reasons for the celebration in these verses. Now, Revelation chapter 19 is kind of wrapping up the book of Revelation, kind of summarizing, if you will, not only Revelation, but the whole great controversy. And here's the summary that God brings to us, beginning in verse 1, Revelation chapter 19. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Now, just pause there for a second. Revelation 19.1 is paralleling um, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 23 and 24. We're in heaven. We're on Mount Zion. We hear a great voice, but there's more here. It kind of builds on the picture because Revelation 14 talks about Mount Zion mm -hmm. and the 144,000 being there mm -hmm. and a gathering taking place. Revelation 19 brings us a bigger, fuller picture in the context of Daniel, or excuse me, Hebrews 12, 23 of judgment. Next verse, verse 2 says, For true and righteous are His judgments. Now, the previous verse is calling us to say, Alleluia, which means praise the Lord. Why? For true and righteous are His judgments. Now, let's just pause for a second. Have you ever been misjudged, misrepresented? Have you ever seen judgments in this world that are unfair and unrighteous? Well, now we have the final settling of accounts. We have true justice. We have true judgments. We have truth taking place here, righteousness taking place here. And they are God's judgments. For He, it says in verse 2, has judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of His servants at her hand. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, <laughs> give him water to drink. That is challenging to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile. Mm -hmm. The thing that motivates us to do that, part is not just the, the love of God, but also the fact that God will judge. God will take care. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And we've come to that day in Revelation 19 when God is repaying. That's what the celebration is about in Hebrews chapter 12, but it goes on. And again, they said, verse 3, Alleluia. So we've already been asked to praise God one time. Now we're asked to praise Him again after we hear the reason that His judgments have been made manifest. Because if you've been, if you've been beaten, if you've been mm. uh, battered, if you've been bruised by sin, by evil, if you've been um, robbed or raped or ridiculed, if you've been hurt or hated or hunted, if you've gone through any of the things that are described, not only in the Bible, but in, in this world, the things that we experience in this world, you are going to be praising the Lord that a judgment, that a righteousness, that a fairness has finally mm. been established. That's and right. that is what yeah. Revelation chapter 19 is telling us. In fact, in verse 4 it says, and the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God and they s that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. And then in verse 5 it says, And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise God, all you servants, and ye that fear Him, small and great. So there's a command given to praise God because of His righteous judgments. And verse 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as it were, the voice of many waters, and the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Our voice combined together, I should say our voices combined together are going to sound like the voice of many thunderings. You know, yes. thunder is powerful. 
oh, I'd love to hear that thunder. I remember I was sitting on the, on the edge of my bed one evening, just listening to the thunder and watching the lightning off in the distance, you know, and, and I was just saying, oh, that <laughs> And all of a sudden, a lightning bolt hit right in front of our window and the thunder clapped and I jumped off my bed onto the floor. It was so scary. <laughs> thunder is powerful. Thunder is beautiful, but thunder reveals the power and the presence of God. Many times in the Bible, we're told that God thunders with his voice. In fact, when God mm -hmm. spoke to Jesus at the temple there, mm -hmm. a lot of the people that heard that voice thought that it thundered. Mm -hmm. So we have this proclamation, if you will, this, this command in a sense to praise God for his righteousness, for his righteous judgments. That is why it's described as a celebration in Hebrews chapter 12, 22 to 24. It alludes, the quarterly says, the author says, to a future judgment. Mm. God the judge presides, the books are used, they're opened, and the result of this future judgment from the books is that God's people receive the kingdom. The quarterly goes on to say, this scene invokes the great pre-advent judgment described in Daniel 7, which portrays a judgment scene where God, the Ancient of Days, sits on a throne made of fire and is surrounded with 10,000 times 10,000 of angels. Books are opened and the judgment is described in favor or decided in mm. favor of the saints of the Most High. I love that. That's the right. judgment is made in our favor. And then it goes on to say, and we, the saints of the Most High, then possess the kingdom. So this is similar to Hebrews chapter 12, 22 to 29, which describes a judgment scene on Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, where God, the judge of all, is surrounded with thousands of thousands of angels. This scene is also a fiery one, according to Hebrews 12, 29. It includes books because the saints are enrolled in them, which implies a favorable judgment for the saints. The spirits of just men made perfect would be the spiritual character of just men perfected by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And then it goes on to ask this question toward the end of our lesson for Monday. It says, how does what we study today help us to understand that God's judgment in the three angels' messages is good news because mm. the everlasting gospel says to all the nations that dwell on the earth, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Well, there are three reasons why the judgment is good news. Reason number one, three takeaways. <laughs> Takeaway number one, <laughs> Revelation chapter 14 is good news because it comes under the proclamation of the everlasting gospel and the everlasting yes. gospel is good news. Good. And we have to define the context in that the judgment in that context. And of course, Romans chapter 14 tells us that the reason why the judgment is good news is because it gets us off the hook. Everyone's going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, so we don't need to judge anyone anymore. Mm -hmm. You right. don't need to judge me. I don't need to judge you. We, we are right. taken off the hook from judging one another because God is the final judge. Matthew chapter 7 tells us it's good news because Matthew 7 explains that there are people who come to the Lord in the end of time and they point to their good works and they say, we've done this and we've done that. Let us in. Well, the judgment basically reminds us not to depend on our good works to be entering into the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Jesus says, I don't know you. Our entrance into heaven is not based upon our good works. It's based upon our relationship with Christ and our Amen. trust right. in his righteousness. Amen. The third reason for the judgment being good news is found in Revelation chapter 12, verses 9, 10, and 11. And in Revelation chapter 12, it basically tells us that Jesus Christ being lifted up was the reason why the devil was cast out of this earth and his angels were cast out with him. In other words, Jesus Christ and the cross, the everlasting gospel finally not only vindicates us, but also vindicates God's character. It silence the ac silences the accusations of Satan against us because in Revelation 12 verse 10, we're told that the accuser is cast down who accuses us before God day and night. 24, 7, 365 days a year, we have this accuser and we hear his words. He points to our history. He seeks to undermine our confidence in Christ and his righteousness. He seeks to place upon us a guilt trip to weigh us down. This is the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this guilt that God wants mm -hmm. to press us down with, excuse me, that Satan wants to press us yeah. down with. And Satan is finally going to be vanquished. So the judgment is good news because we don't have to judge others, because we don't have to trust in our works to be saved, and right. because the accuser's voice is going to be silenced. According to Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17, I believe it is, 
That is our heritage or our inheritance. Every weapon that is formed against us is going to come to naught and his voice is finally going to be silenced by the righteous claims of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. What great hope. Amen. Good news. Amen. Praise That's the right. Lord. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our study on Hebrews chapter 12, Receiving an Unshakable Kingdom. And I'm going to toss it over to Pastor John in Tuesday's lesson. Yes, yeah, shake the heavens and the earth. Who do you know that can do that? <laughs> Only God. The writer of Hebrews takes us to some scenes in the Bible that are often overlooked. God intervening. And I'm going to talk about it in seven different ways. <laughs> the intervention of God. You know, one of the wonderful things about being a child of God is we have God on our side. And I begin with the words of the Apostle Paul, if God be for us, yeah. mm -hmm. who can be against That's us? Right. That's right. And so one plus God equals the majority. Mm -hmm. When we look at God's intervention throughout human history, the writer of Hebrews brings us to that work that God is going to accomplish, the shaking of the heavens and the earth. And he describes that this is an event that is yet to occur. Hebrews 12, verse 26. Hebrews 12, verse 26. He describes whose voice then shook the heaven. But now he is promised saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Verse 27. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. When I was growing up, my mother used to uh, make cakes and she would give me the responsibility of sifting the flour. Mm -hmm. And this is the old days, you just do it by hand. It, had a, it, had a, it looked like a, 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 a container yeah. that had three or four different strainers, the larger one, then the medium size, and the smaller one, and the very fine one. And she would say, keep pouring the flour in there and just, just go ahead and shake it, shake it, shake it. And the powdery flour would come out the end. She said, okay, do it one more time, do it one more time. And I, as I look at that, I think about God is making sure in the shaking time that only those things that cannot be shaken will remain. Mm -hmm. He's removing all of the dross, the things that we don't see with our human eyes. He's purifying the church, getting it ready for that ultimate victory. Mm -hmm. And as the writer of Hebrews, Paul writes this in <coughs> Hebrews 12, it's a, it's a throwback to Haggai chapter two, verse six and nine. It says, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more is a little while, mm -hmm. it, it is a little while I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land. I will shake all nations and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Verse eight, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord. The glory of the latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Mm. The day of Pentecost was an ama amazing day but the former shall be more glorious than the latter. That's right. It was, it was located in Jerusalem, but when the glory of God is revealed in the end time shaking, it is going to be global. The glory of God, Isaiah 60, arise, shine for mm -hmm. the light has come and the glory of the Lord shall be risen upon you That's right. at a time when darkness covers the earth. So let's look at one of the examples of how throughout history that God's presence was noted by the shaking. You find in Judges chapter 5 and verse 20, this is uh, an example when God fought on behalf of his people. Hmm. It shows that when God shows up to deliver his people, when Deborah and Barak fought against Sisera, God fought from the heavens on their behalf. Hmm. Judges 5 verse 20, they fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. Hmm. That's God using nature to fight in behalf of his people. Mm -hmm. You know, the fire by day, 
uh, the, the pillar of cloud by day, the fire by night. God uses nature to fight in behalf of his people. And this is emphasized once more in Judges chapter 5, verse 4 and 5, indicating now this shaking is uh, a reference to the presence of God being revealed. Judges 5, verse 4 and 5. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured. The clouds also poured water. The mountains gushed before the Lord. This Sinai before the Lord God of Israel. So we find clearly the presence of God thundering as James uses, you know, when God walks, when God's presence is near. Another Bible writer, I think it's the book of Micah, he says, the clouds are the dust of God's feet. Mm -hmm. And so when we see the presence of God, we see that nature participates in introducing God when he steps in on behalf of humanity. We also find in the, the third example, the Lord uh, stepping in and thundering the heavens to deliver his oppressed people. Psalm 68, verse 7 and 8. O oh God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, Selah, the earth shook, the heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. We find that happening in the experience of the children in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Then we go to number four, Psalms 96, verse 9 and 10, the shaking signal God's judgment as he asserts his authority on the earth in behalf of his people once again. And the prophet predicted this would happen. Psalms 96, verse 9, O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Verse 10, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Mm. And then we find that the Lord uses shaking of the heavens and the earth to destroy the enemies of God. This is what God promised at the enthronement of Jesus. Look at Hebrews 1 verse 13. Hebrews 1 verse 13. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Mm -hmm. And this is what, what God is going to do. He's going to shake the heavens. You'll find at the enthronement of Jesus, there would be a, a signaling that the presence of God is stepping to the forefront, mm -hmm. indicating the enthronement of Christ. We also find in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 16, the Bible talks about the defeat of the enemy of God. And um, this, this one doesn't use the word shaking much in it, but it's a reference back to the presence of God being invoked in behalf of his people, delivering them. And in this case, instead of this being a physical shaking, it is shaking the kingdom of darkness. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 2, verse 14 and 16, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, mm -hmm. and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Verse 16, for indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed mm -hmm. of Abraham. Amen. He's fighting in behalf of the people of God. He's fighting in behalf of his children. Now let's, let's move down to the time of the end. We also go to Luke chapter 21, verse 25 and 26. Mm -hmm. This shaking is a sign from God signaling the inhabitants of the earth that we are approaching the time of the end, living in the time of the end. Luke 21, verse 25 and 26. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Verse 26. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. Why? For the powers of the heavens mm -hmm. will be shaken. God is signaling earth and its inhabitants that the time of my return, the time of my visitation is near. And men's hearts are being drawn to the event, shaking men's hearts. So they're fearful mm -hmm. of what is coming upon the earth in the closing hours of earth's history. Finally, Number seven, the shaking of the earth happens at the appearance of the return of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 4 and verse 26, we read these words. I beheld 
And indeed, the fruitful land was a wilderness mm -hmm. and all the cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. You can't break cities down like New York and Chicago and Los Angeles unless there's a whole lot of shaking going on. <laughs> And so God is going to shake the earth. All these fortresses that men have built to defy the authority and the divinity of God will come crumbling down. Mm -hmm. That's why we read Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. What will their response be? Revelation 6, verse 9 to 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? In verse 11, then a little, then a white robe was given to each of them. Mm -hmm. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Mm -hmm. When God steps forward to avenge his people, there will be a whole lot of shaking going on. Mm. Mm. Amen. Mm. Amen. 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 Well, I'm John Vincy, and I have win, uh, Wednesday's portion. The title is An Unshakable Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Praise God. So here in this lesson, uh, we, he, we have an announcement that he will shake the heavens and the earth, which means he will destroy the enemy nations. And we are going to look at some scriptures that talk about things that cannot be moved. Let's look at Psalm 16, verse 8. This is one of the scriptures uh, presented in the lesson. It says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Mm -hmm. When we have the Lord with us, we yeah. shall not be moved. Look at Psalm 21, verse 7. For the king trusts in the Lord and through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. We have to have God as uh, the person we can, tr uh, the, the one we can trust and we shall not be moved. Psalm 62, verse 1 and 2. Truly, my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. Mm -hmm. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Psalm 116, mm -hmm. uh, Psalm 112. Now we go to verse 6. It says, surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. Praise the Lord. That's Psalm mm -hmm. 112, verse 6. And so now we turn to the scripture that is the foundation for this portion. It says Hebrews 12, verse 26 and 27. Notice, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven, now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken will remain. Mm -hmm. The lesson brings out this uh, thought that I like to share with you. The Bible is clear. God will create new heavens and new earth. As you see in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17 and Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. And we will have a resurrected body. We will be changed. You can see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. And I'd like to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 15 uh, beginning in verse 51. This is powerful, and we need to picture this. Notice, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Talking about the Christians. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Mm. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Mm. Praise God. And verse 55, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's right. So as you look uh, at the scriptures, you will notice, uh, as the lesson says, that permanence and stability are associated 
with Jesus. Yes, that's Hebrews good. chapter 1, verse 10 to 12 says, And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, mm -hmm. and they will all grow old like a garment. Mm -hmm. Like a cloak, you will fold them up, and they shall be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not fail. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now concerning Jesus, the Bible uh, says this. Uh, it says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3, Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto, made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Jesus remains a priest continually. Mm. In Rebel, uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24 and 25, But he, because he continues forever, Mm. has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Oh, this mm. Jesus is the one that you need to follow. This Jesus is the one who has died for you. And this Jesus is the one who will be coming to take you to live eternally with him. Mm. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Notice, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, Amen. let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So this kingdom that cannot be shaken, how is it that there is such a kingdom promised to God's children? I point you to Jesus and in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, an announcement is made because when Jesus died on the cross, He secured for us salvation yes. and He secured for us a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Amen. Notice Amen. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Yeah. Satan has been defeated. Satan has been defeated. The kingdom belongs to God, a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And you can be a part of that kingdom if you give yourself, give yourself completely to the Lord, accept that sacrifice. The word needs to be spread all over the world. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then the end shall come. Mm -hmm. And when God does away with all the evil, Satan and all the wicked, God's everlasting kingdom will be established forever. New heavens and a new earth. Now I want to uh, highlight some interesting differences between the righteous and the wicked because they, there's a difference between the two. Notice in Psalm 32, verse 10, many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but mm -hmm. he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Praise the Lord. Isaiah uh, 57, verse 20 and 21, but the wicked are like the troubled sea mm -hmm. when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. There's no peace for the wicked. Mm. There cannot be peace for the wicked. Right. But notice Isaiah 26, verse 3 and 4. Mm. This is a blessing for God's yeah. children here and forever. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For in Jehovah, the Lord is everlasting strength. Praise the Lord. Job chapter 20, verse 4 and 5. Do you not know this of old since man was placed on earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short. <laughs> mm. Praise the Lord. And the joy of the hip hypocrite is but for a moment. Mm. But notice Psalm 37, verse 29, the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. Right. Praise God. Mm. Notice now Psalm 37, verse 20, but the wicked mm. shall perish and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the metals, shall vanish into smoke, they shall vanish away. Mm. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. John chapter 10, verse 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. 
and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ has the Lamb of God died for us on the cross. He is our high priest ministering in the most holy place in heaven. Mm -hmm. He has for you and me an unshakable kingdom, mm -hmm. a kingdom that will last forever and ever and ever. And today the door of mercy is still open. And I encourage you, if you have not made your decision, if you have not placed your trust and your life in the hands of the Lord, mm -hmm. do it. <laughs> Don't let a moment pass by because right. We need to have our salvation secured in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Satan is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And you have the opportunity now to give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ so you can be part of that unshakable kingdom. And so take the opportunity while you have it. Don't wait for another moment because you are not promised another moment. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you to take Jesus as your Savior and allow Him to lead and guide in your life so that you can have peace and live eternally throughout the world without end. Amen. 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 Praise Amen. the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Denzi. I love that. The unshakable kingdom. My name is Ryan Day. I have Thursday's lesson entitled, Let Us Be Grateful. And of course, it, the lesson brings out that Hebrew con Hebrews concludes this section by pointing out the appropriate response to God for all the wonderful things He has done for us to show gratitude by offering Him an appropriate type of of worship. This is important. Showing gratitude is showing an appropriate type of worship. Of course, this is building on Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. We've read it a couple of times. Let's read it again. Hebrews 12 and verse 28. The Bible says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And then of course, also Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 and 16 with that. Notice what Hebrews 13, 15 and 16 says. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise mm -hmm. to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Mm -hmm. in, the old, in the old covenant system, the sacrifice of animals was the way people showed repentance and gratitude. But these sacrifices were to be but a token of gratitude and repentance in the heart of the worshiper. Thus God made clear in the Psalms and through the prophets that what really pleased Him was not the blood of animals, but of the gratitude, good deeds, and righteousness of the worshiper. We see this in Psalm chapter 50, verses 7 through 23, as well as Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 through 17. And of course, I just want to highlight Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, because the Lord says there, He says, wash yourselves, mm. make yourselves clean, put away the evil uh, the evil of your doings before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. These are the things that please God. These are the things that show forth true worship and gratitude towards our God. These are the things that catches God's eye. Thus Paul invites us to worship God in the heavenly sanctuary by offering sacrifices of praise, confession, thanks Thanksgiving and good works, which is true worship that delights Him. And I just want to take time to just highlight each one of those elements because when we think of worship, oftentimes we think of the actions that we do. And, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you know, extending of the hands or, or maybe a prayerful type of de declaration. All of these things are forms of worship. They are actions. And a lot of times we get the liturgy uh, of services confused with worship. Uh, these are expressions of worship. But my friends, at the end of the day, worship is the attitude of the heart. And there are many different forms in which we can communicate, express our worship to the Lord. Uh, we have mentioned this a few times already, but praising God, just simply offering up. A, how often do you praise God? Do you praise God as you should? Psalm 103 verse 1, bless, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. I, I had the privilege of working uh, with many pastors over the years, but uh, you know, one particular pastor comes to mind. I, I was spending 
time as I was at an evangelistic series with him. And this brother, I mean, he would walk around randomly at, at all kinds of all different points of the time of the day. And he would say, hallelujah, mm. walking by. We'd be at the dinner table and this brother mid bite would just say, praise his holy name. Mm. And he would just offer up praises all the time. And, and there'd be times I w- he didn't even know I was in the next room mm. or in the house. And you would hear him walking through the house saying, praise be, glory be to God. I mean, this brother was genuine in his praise for God. And it let me know, you know what? I need to worship God more. Mm-hmm. I need to praise God more. Why? Because the Bible says he is worthy to be praised. He is our creator. Psalm 9, chapter 1, verse 2, or excuse me, Psalm chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. It says, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell all of your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. There's so many different texts that we could talk about in reference of praising God. But when you praise God, you are showing your gratitude towards him. You are giving him worship, the worship that pleases him. Also thanksgiving, Mm. expressing thanksgiving, which is a little, it's different than praise. You're you're giving thanks to God for who he is and what he's done for you. First Thessalonians chapter five, verses 16 through 18. I love this. It says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing Mm. in everything. What is that word there again? In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. First Chronicles 16, 34. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. And another great text, I'm not going to read it for sake of time here, but Philippians chapter four, verses four through seven. My friends, when we give and express our thanks to God, we're showing our gratitude towards him because he indeed is worthy. We show forth worship. We communicate our gratitude through the good works that we do for God. Mm. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight through 10. We know the word, we know the words too well for by grace, you have been saved Mm. through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And many people stop right there. Mm. They don't read verse 10. Verse 10 is tacked on right on with these previous verses. Yes, we are not (laughs) saved by our works. We're saved by the grace of God through faith in him. But make no mistake, my friends, verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It is God's plan. It's his will for us to do good works. It's our, it's his will that we do these things because not because it saves us, but because it shows forth our relationship with him. It shows forth that the genuineness of our faith is pure and our gratitude and our worship in him. James chapter two, verses 14 through 17 says, what does it profit my brethren? If someone says that he has faith, but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister, now it gets down to the nitty gritty. If the brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace and be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? And then in verse 17, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it is dead. You can say all day long, and just like Christ said, they draw nigh to me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Do you have a worshipful heart? Does does your works tell the story, the reality of your faith in God? Because when we see our brothers and sisters in need, how we relate to our brothers and sisters, how we show forth our love for them shows how much of the love of God is in our heart and how much of that worship we give to him. John 15, verse 12 through 13, this is my commandment, Jesus says, Mm -hmm. that you love one another Mm -hmm. as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that they lay down one's life for his brother. Mm -hmm. Repentance and confession. This is crucial. When you, when you repent, when you're in a state of repentance and you're confessing before the Lord, you're expressing your gratitude for what he has done for you. You're expressing a form of worship to him. Second Chronicles 7, verse 14, my, one of my favorite texts. Yeah. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and mm-hmm. seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven mm-hmm. and will forgive their sin and mm-hmm. heal yes. their land. Right. First John chapter one, verses eight through 10. This is that uh, gospel mm-hmm. sandwich mm-hmm. we learned about mm-hmm. in previous lessons. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just yeah. to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Is the word of God in you. Mm-hmm. Do you have the heart of the Savior? Are you expressing that worship and that gratitude through the, through the form of f- repentance and forgiveness mm-hmm. because of what Christ has done for you? Mm-hmm. That's what the lesson is talking about. Obedience. Mm-hmm. 
This is one of the greatest forms, the highest form of worship, mm -hmm. obedience. Acts chapter 5, verse 32, and we are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. If right. you are purposely, willingly, not, uh, willfully not obeying God, my friends, there's no evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in your life because you have rejected the Holy Spirit. Mm. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, we've heard it too many times. If you love me, mm -hmm. keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. It's all based on a relationship of love. Even Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Mm. Jesus mm. is looking for genuine Christians, genuine followers, genuine disciples who are expressing by their works, by the attitude of their heart, their worship for Him, mm. their gratefulness, their thankfulness, their praise. It shows forth and tells the story of the genuineness of their faith. That's why I love 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, because we don't, we don't, we don't obey God because it gains us salvation. Mm -hmm. We obey Him because we love Him. That's we right. obey Him because He has saved us. We obey Him because He is worthy. He is the God of the universe. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. We don't serve a God mm -hmm. that burdens us. We serve a God who has saved us. Mm -hmm. Are you grateful for His love? Are you grateful for that God of love? Show forth that love today. Give praise to Him. Give honor to our King. Amen. Amen. Thank Lord. you so Amen. much. Uh, I love that because worship is so much deeper than we think. Uh, thank you so much, Pastor Ryan. Pastor Johnny, Pastor John, and Pastor James, mm -hmm. thank you for the study this week. My heart has been so blessed. Want to give each one of you a moment, share something about the week. Well, thank you, Jill. It's been a blessing to be on this particular program. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17, just to summarize a little bit of what we have been talking about, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, yeah. thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage, the inheritance of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. Amen. That's right, and we're living in times that are going to challenge our spiritual walk, but I end with the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 2. He says, Not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. The day is coming, but until that day, do not allow the, the things of this world, the challenges of life, to shake your faith. Amen. 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 And I would like to share from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, But as it is written, eyes have not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. You can be a part of that unshakable kingdom and the things that God has prepared for us, you cannot even imagine. Mm. Amen. Praise the Lord. Psalm chapter 63, verses 3 and 4 says, because, you, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. Right there, if Danny Shelton was here right now, he'd say, that's a two-handed. <laughs> praise the Lord, O oh my soul. <laughs> Amen. It's been an incredible journey through the book of Hebrews. It's not done. There is one more week left. Next week, lesson number 13, the title is Let Brotherly Love Continue. I want to remind you that we can't change the time. We can't change where we live, but we can change our response and our experience. We are under the new covenant. Praise the Lord for that. But we have a choice to make each and every day. Are we going to walk in that new covenant experience with Jesus? Are we going to experience him? Are we going to walk in the old covenant experience? The choice, my friends, is yours.